Welcome to another big train tour at the Colorado Railroad Museum. Today, we're going to be taking a look at something a little different, the museum's turntable. This familiar artifact has been a fixture within the museum's roundhouse complex for over 20 years now. Like all of the many historic structures, locomotives, and railroad cars found at the Colorado Railroad Museum, our turntable has its own unique history with a few interesting twists that we'll be exploring in this big train tour today. Hi, I'm Paul Hammond, Executive Director of the Colorado Railroad Museum. Our subject this week is not a train per se, but a very large and important part of the railroad environment nonetheless. Like many railroad artifacts, the museum's turntable was built for one location and later it worked in an entirely different one. It even changed track gauges during its service life. Although it hails from outside of Colorado, its unique past makes this turntable especially relevant to Colorado's rich railroading past. It also has a much larger story to relate to the history of railroading all across North America. Turntables have been used on railroads since well before the advent of the steam locomotive. The earliest animal-powered railways in Great Britain, for instance, ran on wooden rails and used very short turntables as an early form of a track switch. At these early turntables, circa the 16th century, carts would be turned sideways to be routed onto a different line of track. Since the carts were quite short, the turntables likewise were short perhaps six feet to start with, and quite primitive compared to what we think of when we describe a turntable today. The advent of the steam locomotive changed this early dynamic. Particularly here in the United States, early British locomotive designs were radically transformed into something uniquely American. Guiding wheels, or pony trucks, were added at the front of the locomotive to help guide locomotives over uneven trackage, including steep gradients and sharp curvature. The primary reason was because railroads in the United States were constructed as tools of development, and thus the tracks and the rights of way were typically built to conform to the topography, and as cheaply as possible. Contrast this with British practice, where railroads were built in relatively straight lines between cities, with stone arch bridges and major grading as part of the permanent way, as it was called. Tenders were also added to locomotives in order to provide storage capacity for additional fuel and water. So, with their leading wheels and tenders, steam locomotives became one-directional in terms of their usual direction of travel. Going backwards just wasn't an option most of the time, both because of reduced visibility and bad tracking characteristics. This in turn meant that locomotives would need to be turned for at least a couple of major reasons. First, at the end of the line, if a locomotive was heading back in the opposite direction, and secondly, to access the railroad's roundhouse, which quickly became the locomotive's servicing and repair facility of choice. There's more than one way to turn a locomotive, of course. A Y, a sort of triangle arrangement of tracks involving three turnouts or switches, is often used when the necessary space is available. Sometimes a balloon track might be installed as an alternative for turning locomotives or even entire trains, although these require even more land than most Ys occupy. But in situations where space is limited, either physically or economically, a turntable was often the most suitable option. When it came to roundhouses built for servicing a railroad's steam locomotives at strategic locations, turntables were required in order to avoid what otherwise would have been a maze of turnouts and lots of extra trackage. A cousin to turntables, the transfer table, was also deployed in major repair facilities in order to allow for shifting of cars and locomotives between various closely spaced buildings. The museum's turntable was originally built and deployed for the simplest and most straightforward of reasons, to turn locomotives at the end of a railroad line, with no roundhouse anywhere to be found nearby. Only later in its life would first an engine house, 
and then within the last two decades, a full roundhouse become part of the railroad landscape that this turntable would serve. Let's go back in time now and take a look at the history of the Colorado Railroad Museum's turntable. Our turntable story is a fun one with some interesting twists. It was originally constructed for the Fulton County Narrow Gauge Railway, which operated in west central Illinois between Galesburg and West Havana. Owned by the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad and operated as a subsidiary, this 60-mile, three-foot gauge short line was slated for standard gauging at the time the turntable order was placed. Thus, this turntable from the beginning was a much more substantial structure than most narrow gauge railroads would have ever needed. Ordered from Lassig Bridge and Iron Works of Chicago, this turntable was delivered in the summer of 1900. Interestingly, Lassig was merged into the new American Bridge Company at the same time the bridge was being built. So the turntable's builder plate notes that it was built by American at its Lassig plant. Once delivered, the turntable was installed in a shallow pit in a place called Parville, which no longer exists. The turntable was Armstrong powered, meaning that trainmen simply had to push the table by hand to turn their locomotive. It was located at the end of a spur line serving a deep shaft coal mine, allowing locomotives to be turned for the return trip to Galesburg. Coal was a very important commodity for the Fulton County narrow gauge, accounting for well over half of its traffic base. Just five years after the turntable was installed, standard gauging of the line was complete, so the rails on the turntable were regaged to standard. The formerly narrow gauge railroad continued to operate as a standard gauge branch of the Burlington system until the early 1930s, when the northern portion of the line, including the Parville Spur, was abandoned during the Great Depression. Deep shaft coal mining by the mid-1920s was declining in this part of Illinois, replaced by open pit strip mining in other regions. So even before the line's abandonment, the Parville Spurs turntable had been removed and sent to a new location. It ended up at Kansas, located at the end of a Burlington branch line in the very northwest corner of the state, about 15 miles east of the Colorado border. The turntable was reinstalled in 1927 in the small town of St. Francis to replace a smaller and older wood frame turntable built in the 1880s. A Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad Authority for Expenditure, or AFE, shows the basic plan for the replacement at that time. In addition to turning locomotives, the turntable now also served a two-stall engine house in St. Francis. This humble, originally narrow gauge, but now standard gauge turntable in St. Francis was also equipped with an air operated mechanism for turning, meaning that trainmen no longer had to do the pushing. The necessary air pressure was supplied by each locomotive as it was being turned. The turntable served the Burlington dutifully in St. Francis for over 40 years and continued to do so after the railroad was merged into the Burlington Northern system in 1970. With the 1995 merger of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe and the Burlington Northern, however, the branch line to St. Francis was sold the next year to a short line operator. The turntable was no longer needed, and it was acquired by a nearby rancher, who in turn donated the turntable to the Colorado Railroad Museum. It was moved to the museum site in Golden in 1996. But before we head back into that part of its history, let's first explore how a turntable works. So, how does it work? A turntable, in essence, is simply a bridge structure. Think of it as a swing bridge with a center swivel for turning and a bridge structure to support the loads placed on it. Turntable design, like bridge design, has taken many forms and engineering approaches over the years. Some designs were meant to minimize having to build large foundations or maybe to avoid the need for a pit entirely. Sometimes these were purely for cost reasons and sometimes because of a site-specific constraint such as sandy soil or a high water table. As the size and weight of steam locomotives increased in the 20th century, turntables at major servicing facilities utilized a variety of structural styles to carry the increasingly heavy loads. Our turntable's structural design is one of the most simple and common found throughout the U.S. 
Known as a plate girder bridge, it utilizes large steel plates and other structural steel shapes fastened together to form what are essentially I-beams. These I-beams vary in height and thickness to provide the greatest strength where it is needed. The two continuous I-beams, which are taller in the center and taper towards the ends, are in turn connected together with a series of other structural steel components. Large wooden bridge timbers are then placed on top of the main girders and fastened down with special hooks that clamp to the steel. Rails are then laid on top of the timbers. The turntable is primarily supported on a single central main bearing. This bearing involves a series of tapered rollers. Think of them as a bunch of small steel wheels that are designed to turn in a very small diameter circle. These rollers are held together within a large steel ring with other support castings and a centering pin to keep everything in alignment. This central bearing is what actually carries all of the loads. The ring rail that you see down in the pit is simply there to carry the locomotive's weight when it's getting on and off the turntable. When a locomotive first enters the turntable, the table actually tilts in the direction of the locomotive and the smaller outer wheels touch down on the ring rail to support its weight as the locomotive rolls onto the table. As the locomotive advances across the turntable, the table acts a bit like a teeter-totter. It eventually lifts off one side of the ring rail, then tilts in the other direction to touch down on the opposite side of the ring rail. At that point, the engineer stops and reverses direction slowly until the table reaches its balancing point with both sides of the teeter-totter now balanced up in the air. All of the weight of the locomotive and the turntable are now sitting entirely on that central bearing. Balancing the locomotive on the central bearing is what will now make it relatively easy to turn the table by hand. Another scientific principle also comes into play now, leverage. One or two people can turn the table and the locomotive by pushing against long wood handles that are attached to the ends of the table. These handles stick out to provide both a safe place for trainmen to brace themselves for pushing outside of the turntable pit, as well as providing additional leverage to help make turning easier. A turntable also has other aspects that may not be as obvious. For instance, when the table is lined up for a particular track, how is it prevented from turning underneath the locomotive? There are actually a number of ways this can be accomplished. For our turntable, a railroad switch stand is a part of a system which in turn moves a series of levers to either engage or disengage a locking mechanism. This mechanism directly indexes into fixed slots centered on each track. And what about the rails on the turntable? It's one thing when a turntable serves a single track gauge. But for this one, our turntable is today serving tracks of two different gauges. On a turntable, dual gauge involves four rails total, not just three as is typical on dual gauge railroad trackage. Why? Because, well, just think about it. If you want to turn a narrow gauge locomotive 180 degrees, on which side would the third or narrow gauge rail end up? It would be different each time. So it's necessary to install specialized track components on the main approach track serving the term table from the outside world. These components transfer narrow gauge locomotives and cars from a third running rail, common in dual gauge railroading, to a centered four rail setup so as to make it possible to turn locomotives of both gauges on the museum's turntable. There's one more often overlooked aspect that all turntables must consider. Rail creep a phenomenon that all railroad track is subject to. On a warm summer day, rails expand by a few fractions of an inch, and on a cold winter's night, they contract. This process of expansion and contraction goes on every day. With the passing of the seasons over time, rails and trackage can accumulate inches of movement horizontally, usually in one direction. Railroads today use rail clips, which are clipped directly onto the base of the rails right up against the sides of railroad ties to help create a drag within the rock ballast that the ties are bedded into. These clips greatly limit the inevitable movement that takes place with all this differential expansion and contraction. The phenomenon is more pronounced on steeper grades. 
rails tend to creep downhill, as well as on turntables. But why turntables? Well, each time a locomotive enters or exits and starts or stops on the table, there's a bit of horizontal force exerted. Rail clips can't be installed on bridge structures because there's no ballast to create drag against. Instead, on our turntable, a series of interesting metalwork brackets are directly affixed to the rails and in turn bolted directly into several of the turntable's decking timbers to limit horizontal movement. Donated to the museum in 1996, the turntable was a fortuitous find at the time. Plans were then being developed for the museum's roundhouse complex and it had become clear that a turntable would be needed to provide access to the structure that was envisioned. Space was just too limited on the museum site to build what would otherwise have been a long lead track to serve an engine house. Loaded by cranes onto a large flatbed trailer and then driven to the museum, the turntable arrived in Golden and was unloaded with another crane onto timbers near its proposed future location. The tightly curved rails for the ring rail installation were also brought to the museum and stored for the time being. When you're designing a roundhouse, it's important to know how a number of factors will influence the design. With acquisition of a specific turntable assured and definitive turntable length and other characteristics now known, the roundhouse's final design could now proceed. The necessary turntable foundations could also be designed and constructed. The main central support bearing required its own large foundation. Since it's mostly underground and not visible, this foundation doesn't seem large, but trust us, it is. Once the central foundation was in place, the retaining walls, which share a common foundation and structure with the ring rail supports, were formed and poured. The turntable structure could now be placed. Another crane did those honors. Then crews constructed the bridge deck, another major project all by itself. Finally, tracks could be built leading into the roundhouse itself, as well as for storage of other locomotives and cars. Today, of course, the museum's turntable is surrounded by lots and lots of tracks that it serves. The roundhouse complex hums with projects year-round, serving as the maintenance base for the museum's operating locomotives, as well as for restoration and maintenance of the approximately 100 rail vehicles that are found throughout the 15-acre museum rail yard. On selected weekends, turntable demonstrations are a popular offering for guests. Where else can you have the opportunity to push a heavy turntable, perhaps with an even heavier locomotive riding along, around in a circle and all with your own hands? This unique and very lucky turntable, built at the very beginning of the 20th century for a narrow gauge railroad that was soon converted to standard gauge, and then moved from its original Illinois location to northwestern Kansas, today has a bright future. It continues to serve the very same purpose it was constructed for, turning locomotives. It's another reminder of the durability, practicality, and ingenuity of railroads, and the many people who have been behind this industry that today continues to transform Colorado and the world around us. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed our tour of the former Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad turntable that today serves the museum roundhouse right here in Golden. I also hope that your appreciation for Colorado's rich railroad heritage continues to grow with each and every tour of the museum's collections. Like, comment, share, and subscribe. Commenting and sharing in particular may qualify as virtual engagements for important funding programs like the SCFD.